Welcome to A Journey with God. I'm your host, Pastor Jay Perry. Life is a spiritual journey. Each week we'll explore a little more about where we're going and how we'll get there. We'll learn to read our maps and follow our guide. You can download a fill-in-the-blank sheet at wichitacornerstone.org. And now, A Journey with God. I don't know how many of you noticed, but 2006 was a big year for my glasses. You probably didn't notice, because I got glasses that are about the same style as my previous glasses, but I'd had those old glasses for six years. Six years. And, you know, I kept on going through life thinking, oh, I don't have time to visit the eye doctor. You know, I just... Six years. So finally I went into the eye doctor and, uh, and I went in and they did all of these tests. And now I don't know if you get nervous with the eye tests. I kind of do because I'm really afraid that if I, if I say something wrong, I'll, I'll end up with these bottle glasses and, and I'll be like, oh no, I, I said the wrong thing on my test and I'll go around all day squinting through my glasses. Because, so I want to get this test right. I want to get the vision test right. And so the doctor comes in and I'm sitting here in the chair and there's this great big, have you been there? There's this great big thing that he puts in front of your face and turns off all of the lights in the room and then he sits really close. He breathes on you. He looks in your eyes with the bright lights. Do you like one or two? One or two? I don't know. Try it again. One or two? Oh, that's... Yeah, one is better. Then he flips it over. A or B? Was there a difference? A or B? And then they do all these sorts of vision tests where they want you to tell... Um, when the point A is right directly under point B. And they want you to tell the exact time. And so you're watching, and they're coming this way. Like, are they, is, it is it now? Is it now? Is it now? Is it now? 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 It's very nerve-wracking. I do not like having my vision tested. I really used to like having vision tests when it was in a doctor's office and you could just look at the card E-F-P-T-O-Z. I can do that. That's not a problem. From 20 feet away, and if you can read line 20, that's 20-20 vision. And that's great. I like those kind of vision tests. But all the big machines, they make me nervous. Today we're going to open up our Bibles and look at a vision test that God did for Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. He's testing Jeremiah's vision. A couple weeks ago, we saw when Jesus tested the disciples' vision. Would they see his vision for the kingdom? Would they see his vision for their personal lives? And here, God is going to tell Jeremiah about the vision he has for him. Is Jeremiah going to back away from the vision? That's the test. Jeremiah, chapter 1, comes right after Isaiah, so I should be able to find it here any time now. Jeremiah, chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. The Lord gave me a message. He said, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my spokesman to the world. Oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. Don't say that, the Lord replied, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And do not be afraid of the people, for I will be with you and take care of you. I, the Lord, have spoken." What a powerful message comes to Jeremiah. God says, I have had a plan for you since before the world began. Since before you were born, I had a plan for you. And you're going to be my spokesman. You're going to be my ambassador to the world. 
And, I, and Jeremiah is looking and he says, no, that's not quite right. That's a little fuzzy. Um, you want me to pick A, but I kind of like B better. Jeremiah says, no, Lord, I can't do it. I'm too young. He wants to back away from the calling that the Lord has given to him. God shows Jeremiah a clear vision of his purpose in life. Wouldn't that be great if each and every one of us could get that clear sense of vision that God has for us? We would love that, wouldn't we? We would love to have a clear picture. We'd love to have a burning bush show up in our living room, as, as long as it wasn't really on fire, right? A burning bush show up in our living room and say, Jay, here's what I want you to do. This is my plan. I, I always expect God has a low voice. This is my plan for you. I don't mean to sound like Darth Vader. This is my plan for you. And I'd say, oh, this is the voice of God. I know now exactly what I'm supposed to do. This is great. But how often does it really happen that way? What I want to tell you from this verse is the same thing that God told Jeremiah. God knew you before he formed you. He has set you apart for something. He has a plan for your life. And I'm not just talking a plan for what he wants you to do today. Yeah, God also has that plan. But I'm talking about the big plan. I'm talking about how God wants you to impact the world. The legacy that God wants you to leave to future generations. God has a plan for you. He formed you with that specific plan in mind. What an amazing thought. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I think we go through our lives so much of the time saying, oh, I'll do this or I'll do that or we choose or, you know, whatever. But in reality, God has a destination that he wants us to arrive at. God has something that he's been planning out before we were born. And so God tells this vision to Jeremiah He says, I had this plan for you for a long time, and here's what it is. You're going to be my ambassador. You are going to be my spokesman to the world. And Jeremiah says, "Mm, no, that's too big for me. I'm too young for that right now. Um, You know, maybe in 10 years I could do that. Maybe later. And he starts to back away. From God's vision. The truth of the matter is that God's vision for us will often be larger and scarier than what we would choose. I think of Abraham, and God told Abraham, Go to a place that I will show you. Now, if God had told Abraham right at the very beginning, okay, you're going to wander around from place to place, and then there are going to be a couple of famines, and you're going to have to go down to Egypt for a long time, and then maybe you'll settle back, and you're going to have trouble having kids. Is that something Abraham would have chosen if he'd known it at the beginning? Probably not. God's vision for us is usually larger and scarier than we would choose. When God called Jonah to minister to the Ninevites, Jonah turned around and ran the other direction. He didn't want to fulfill God's vision for his life. He was scared. He said, this is too big for me. I can't do this. And I'll tell you what, even right before the cross, Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane pleading with his father, saying, I don't want to go through with this. I don't want to be killed on the cross. Please take this cup from me. God's vision for us will often be larger and scarier than something that we would choose on our own. And that's what Jeremiah is responding to here. But I want you to hear what God says. Verse 7. Don't say that, the Lord replied, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And, verse 8, don't be afraid. 
of the people. For I will be with you and take care of you. I, the Lord, have spoken. This is awesome. God promises us power, his power, supernatural power, to carry out the vision that he gives to us. If God commands us to do something, he also empowers us to do it. And we look at Jeremiah's life. If you want to do some really interesting reading um, Sabbath afternoon, you should read just the whole book of Jeremiah straight through and see all of the stuff that Jeremiah encountered. Jeremiah was persecuted. Jeremiah was thrown in prison because he was doing what God told him to do. He was thrown down into a well so that his legs were stuck in the mud down in the bottom of a well. And he was hauled up out of the well. People did not believe the prophecies that he gave and he was ridiculed. God called me to this? But the truth of the matter is, Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, who's in our Bible, helped to lead the nation of Israel and to help them hear God's voice. And God promised him power to carry out his vision. And God promises us the same power to carry out our vision. Now, I also want to quote for you something from Jeremiah chapter 29, 11. In this same book. And here God isn't talking to Jeremiah, but he's talking to the entire nation of Israel. But I think we can take this promise for us. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 says this. God says, I know the plans I have for you. They are plans for good and not for harm to give you a future and a hope. God has a plan for us. His plan isn't for disaster. His plan is to give us a future. His plan is to give us hope. His plan is to do something amazing with our lives, even when we don't know what it is. Well, the doctor said I needed glasses. So they took me into the other room and they fitted me, and they measured how far apart my pupils were and, you know, measured how big my head was this way so that my glasses didn't flare out and do that. And they, uh, they made me glasses. And I put my glasses on, and guess what? I could see. Okay, I could see before, but I could see better. There was more clarity. You know, for the first couple of days, I was like, I don't know how many of you have glasses or corrective lenses, but, you know, I had to figure where I was walking because I wanted to step down too far because it looked a little funny. But, you know, these glasses are so much better than my old glasses. I can see so much more clearly now. Now that I have the right corrective lenses... Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And and God wants to give us some corrective lenses this morning. Hebrews chapter 11. And God starts telling us all of these Bible stories and, and why he's telling all these Bible stories to us. Chapter 11, and I'm just going to start with verse 1. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I'm going to highlight some parts of the chapter here. What is faith? It is the confident assurance that what we hope for is going to happen. It's the evidence of things we cannot yet see. I want you to think of that word see, because we're going to encounter it in a bunch of other places here in in Hebrews 11. God gave his approval to people in days of old because of their faith. By faith, we understand the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we see now did not come from anything that can be seen. And then, Paul in Hebrews starts writing about all of these Bible stories. 
It was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Verse 5, it was by faith that Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. Verse 7, it was by faith that Noah built an ark to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God. Verse 8, it was by faith Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give to him as an inheritance. And I want you to read verse 10 with me. Verse 10 says this, Abraham did this because he was confidently looking forward to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. Abraham was willing to do crazy things that didn't make any sense, Because he had seen God's vision of heaven. He had seen a vision of the holy city. Verse 13. All these were faithful, and they died without receiving what God had promised them, but they saw it all from a distance, and they welcomed the promises of God. Do you hear what's going on here in Hebrews chapter 11? Every single one of these people, every one of these Bible characters had a clear vision of God's plan. And that's why they were willing to go out on a limb. And that's why they were willing to walk and live by faith every day. They had a clear vision. They had taken God's corrective lenses and they'd said, we want to look at the world through God's eyes. And that empowered them. Verse 16. But they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God. He has prepared a heavenly city for them. Verse 24 is amazing. It was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, He refused to be treated as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of the Messiah than to own the treasures of Egypt. Why? He was looking ahead to the great reward that God would give him. Do you see why? Why he made the choices he did? He had on God's corrective lenses. He was looking at the right place and saw it clearly. It was by faith, the children of Israel, etc. Verse 35. Women received their loved ones back again from the dead, but others trusted God and were tortured, preferring to die rather than turn from God and be free. They placed their hope in the resurrection to a better life. I want to stop here before I go on. What I want to tell you is that Bible stories are about average men and women encountering God's vision. These are normal, ordinary people living everyday lives. Some of them were fishermen, some were tax collectors, some of them were shepherds, some of them were herdsmen, others made tents. They were just Ordinary, normal people going about their everyday lives, but something happened. They saw God's vision. They encountered it. And then they obeyed. After seeing God's will for their lives, they saw everything differently. It changed the way they looked at their relationships. It changed the way they looked at their money. It changed the way they looked at their belongings. It changed everything. When they saw God's vision, they couldn't help but follow. When, with God's vision, ordinary men and women turned the world upside down. That's what happens here. And and I want you to know that it's not just them. God didn't stop talking to people when the disciples were done evangelizing the world. God is still speaking. He's speaking to our hearts. He's speaking to us through the Bible. 
Are we willing to encounter God's vision for our lives? Are we willing to do it? Are we willing to put on the corrective lenses, even though they might look a little funny at first and and we don't really recognize the way we thought things used to look? Are we willing to do it? A life of vision is a life of meaning, purpose, and fulfillment. Every one of the... That's not to say that you're not going to have dark times or depressing times or things that when you don't understand what's going on. But in general, when you live a life according to God's vision, when you see what God has in store for you, you know where you're supposed to go. You know what the next step is. You can confidently step out. Now you have meaning in your life. Now you have purpose. Now you have fulfillment because you know that God is working through you for future generations or he's working through you to make a difference in the world around you for your neighbors, for your friends, for your co-workers. What's God's vision for you? The last thing we saw here, and it was in verse 35, and it's kind of sad, But God's vision can even help us make sense of our past suffering and sacrifice. The things that in our lives we'd rather not think about or we'd rather not talk about. Things that hurt us years and years ago. Difficult situations that we went through. God can use those to his honor and glory. And when we see God's vision for our lives, those things can start to make sense and we can say, I can use that. I can use those experiences to minister to other people. I can use those experiences to reach out to others. You know, I think of someone who um, has been abused. And then they go on and they grow up and they they use that abuse not as something to hold them back and to, to kill them inside, but they use that to say, I want to make sure this doesn't happen to other people. And God can use what happened in their past, even when it was bad, to then call them to a vision to change the world around them and to make a difference in people's lives. God's vision can help each one of us make sense of our own past suffering and sacrifice. So here's what's next. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 39 through 40. All these people we have mentioned received God's approval because of their faith. Yet none of them received all that God had promised. Why? Verse 40. For God had far better things in mind for us that would also benefit them. For they can't receive the prize at the end of the race until we finish the race. Do you see who's next in line for an eye exam? Do you see who's next in line to get God's corrective lenses? Do you see who's next in line to turn the world upside down? It's us. We're next in line. We are this generation of God's church. We have an opportunity to encounter God's vision to see what his personal vision is for us, and to say, yes, Lord, I will follow you, just like these men and women in Hebrews chapter 11, and say, yes, Lord, I'm not going to let anything deter me. When I see your vision clearly, Lord, I'm going to go that direction. Nothing is going to stop me. We are next in line. The Bible is clear that we are next in line to encounter God's vision. I talked about this with the burning bush in my living room. Not all vision comes as a supernatural voice or a dream or a burning bush. In fact, when you look at the Bible, God seldom used the same way to talk to people twice. He didn't use a burning bush to talk to anybody else except Moses. He used visions and dreams for some people, but sometimes God used other people. 
to talk to you and, and tell you what God wants you to do. God uses a variety of different ways to reach us. And I wish it were a supernatural voice or a dream or a burning bush. I wish that because that would make life so much easier, wouldn't it? Then we wouldn't have to be involved. Watch out. We wouldn't have to be involved in the process. We could just wake up in the middle of the night and go, whoa, I had a vision. I know what I'm supposed to do now. But that's not the way it works most of the time. In a world of distraction, we must be intentional about seeing God's vision. We must be intentional about listening for God's voice. We can't go on pretending that it's going to happen without our participation. In a world of distraction, everything is vying for our eyes. Television and movies and billboards and advertisements and junk mail and email and spam and everything else that's popping up on the internet. Everything is, is wanting to saturate our vision. There's so much noise going on. Noise from the dishwasher. Who knew? Noise from the television and the radio. and You just can't get away from noise. Right? But you know what? You can. You can, but you have to be intentional about it. In a world of distractions where everything demands our time and attention, we have to be intentional about seeking God, seeking his vision, seeking his will for our lives. It's not going to happen by itself. We have to be intentional about it. And I want to give you a tool today so we can be intentional about it. Higher than the highest human thought is God's ideal for his children. God has a plan for you that's so big you couldn't have thought it up on your own. God has something amazing for you. If the ushers will go into the back and will hand out the vision workbooks, um, I just want to take just a few moments to talk you through the visioning process that each one of you can go, go through. We did this last year. I, I updated the vision workbook uh, this year. Several people went through the vision workbook, and it looks like this. And I even have some large print editions this year, just in case some of you uh, need larger ones. Um, but this is the personal vision workbook. You know, I actually had someone in a different state find the personal vision workbook online um, at, at wichitacornerstone.org, and they downloaded it, and they went through it, and they were so excited about it, they had a friend that they were working with who had just gone through a really messy divorce. And he was having a really hard time with stuff, and he didn't know which direction God wanted him to go, and nothing made sense anymore. It didn't even seem like his prayers were connecting to God. He had an opportunity to go through the personal vision workbook and go through all of the steps in here. And then by the end, he knew what God wanted him to do with his time and his talents and his money. This, this isn't even an Adventist person. This is just someone who found the personal vision workbook online and shared it with a friend. Um, we've had people here in this church go through this process, and we've had some people who've gone through the process say, okay, it's time for me to find a different career. We've had people who went through this process say, okay, I finally figured out what God wants me to do with my resources. God wants me to help other people, other kids get a Christian education. We had people go through the vision workbook who decided that they needed to change their ministry positions in the church. And so, you know, they went through this and they said, you know what? My current ministry position, this isn't where God wants me to be. God wants me to do, be doing something else instead. We had someone go through the personal vision workbook in this church who decided to change careers. Did I already say that? Who decided to change jobs. That's what I said previously. Yeah, and careers too. Uh, we had someone go through the personal vision workbook, and it helped them to make sense of a lot of the pain and suffering that they'd gone through in their lives. And I could tell you stories, but I'm not going to because they haven't given me permission. So there we go. Um, 
Here's the personal vision workbook, and I, I just want to talk you through it page by page. Here's the cover. Put your name on the, on the page um, so that if you lose it, um, anyway, so that you won't lose it. Uh, the first one is, a, is about vision, what vision is all about. Um, and it talks about the baseline vision test. Right now, without thinking about it too, too much, what do you think God's vision is for the church? What do you think God's vision is for your life? And it gives you a process to go through. Page number three is talking about giving God access to your heart. God's not going to force his way into your life. He's not going to force his way into any compartment of your life. If you're not talking to God about your finances, he's not going to talk to you about your finances in general. We need to be giving him access to everything. Even if you're thinking wrong thoughts, just tell God, say, God, these are the thoughts I'm thinking right now. I mean, from my perspective, you don't even have to repent of those thoughts right then. All you have to do is say, God, these are my thoughts. This is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm going through right now. And just by giving God access to that, you're opening up the conversation. And God can speak a word of truth into your life. So page three is all about how to give God access. Page four is about progressive obedience. God has already been talking to you about the things he wants you to do and things he wants you to stop doing. And we need to start obeying God in those areas. If we're not willing to start obeying progressively what he's already told us to do, why would he tell us the big picture? Why would he think we'd be obedient to the calling, to the vision, if we're not being obedient with stuff in our day-to-day lives. So this is all about progressive obedience. And at the bottom, probably the most important thing down here at the bottom is, what will you do about it and who will you tell? It's really important that you ask somebody to keep you accountable. That you tell them, this is what God has been talking to me about, and I'm going to trust you with that. We're going to talk later about, in fact, on the back page, is all about how to find an accountability partner. Page five is about how God has been at work in your past. How has God led in your past? What horrible things in your life have you gone through? Where did you feel God was leading you most in your past? You can go through all of that on page five because God is going to use all of the things in our past, our skills, our experiences, even our pain and suffering to do something amazing for his glory. Page six is about relationships that you've had, mentoring relationships or people who have built values and vision and inspiration into your life. And then it gives you an opportunity to think, huh, who could I mentor? Who can I lead to have these kind of values? Page seven is where it really breaks loose with a personal identity statement. And we have some verses there, and there are other verses in the Bible, if you can think of some others. But these verses talk to you about who you are in relationship to God. What kind of person God has created you to be. This isn't stuff that he's created you to do. This is who he's created you to be. And then page eight is your personal value statement. The things that you value. Do you value punctuality? Do you value excellence? Do you value leadership? Do you value family time? Do you value friends? What do you value? What are three to eight things that you really, really value in life that define who you are, that define how you do business as a person? That's on page eight. Then page nine is going to take probably at least an hour, if not two hours. Okay, so I just want you to know that in advance. This is the personal calling statement. And you're going to go over everything else that you've gone through so far in the workbook. And you're going to have an opportunity to pray through it and look at patterns. How has God led you in the past? And where does he want to lead you in the future? Then you put that all together on page 10. 
Page 11 talks about what you're going to do with it, how you're going to put it in your calendar, specific action steps you're going to take, what books do you need to read, what people do you need to talk to, what help do you need to get, what goals do you want to set for the next six months or one year. And then page 12 is keeping accountable to someone. How do I start an accountability relationship? How can I find someone to keep me on track for the vision that God has given to me? This is a tool that I want you to use. Because I I think, and it, it says this right here in the beginning, that intentionally seeking God's vision for your life is the single most important thing you can do as a Christian. Intentionally seeking God's will, God's vision for your life. I don't want any of you to miss out on this. One of the things that I'll be doing from tonight through Thursday is we'll be opening up the church here. We'll have some soft music going and a picture of Jesus up on the screen. And we'll set up some tables in the back. And this is going to be open every evening, tonight, tomorrow night, all the way through Thursday night, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. And that's here on the front of your, the front of your book. So that you'll have an opportunity to come here Get away from the distractions of home or get away from anything else and come here, spend time praying, spend time going through the workbook and really have an opportunity to see where is God leading. This is what we call Vision Week at Cornerstone. Um, I'll also be here most of the evenings, uh, except Wednesday night I'll be distracted a little bit, but every other time. I'm going to be here so that if you, if you have any questions or you need help with the process, that I can help you go through the steps that are outlined in this book. Also, we have plenty more of these books. Maybe you have a coworker who's going through trouble or a family member who says, I don't know what to do with my life. Maybe you've got a kid in college who is trying to figure out what they should major in, Whatever. If you have a friend or a family member, take one of these and give one of these to them. Um, And just give them the opportunity to go through this kind of process so that they can hear God's voice for themselves and they can see God's vision, what he has in store for them. I also want you to know that Jerry Watts um, has some student editions of these. So if you have kids who are students... Um, in high school generally or even up into early college um, that these are formatted kind of more for them the the 2007 student editions so be sure to pick one of those up um, from Jerry Watts and he'll be in the youth room during Sabbath school isn't that right Um, so that's my sermon God has a plan for your life God wants to do something amazing for you and we have to be intentional about opening up our hearts and opening up our lives to see God's vision. It's time now for our next steps. And if you take out your attendance card, which is that tan card again, and turn it over to the back, you'll notice that there are places on the back that say next step number one, next step number two. They're down at the bottom. Next step number one says this. It says, I will begin to set aside distractions so that I can more fully discern God's vision for my life. If this is your next step, mark box number one on the back of your card. Maybe for you that means you're going to turn off the radio, or maybe you're going to turn off the TV, or maybe you're going to, I don't know what else you could do, uh, not spend so much time on the internet, whatever. If you're going to intentionally get rid of some distractions in your life, at least until you've gone through this process, mark box number one on the back of your card. Box number two says this, says this week I will spend time every day asking God to show me his vision for my life. If you're going to add that to your prayer time during this week, every day you just say, God, I want to see your vision for my life. I want to understand what your plans are. Teach me, Lord. Um, If that's your desire, mark box number two on the back of your card. 
Number three says this. says, I will spend some time this week working through Cornerstone's personal vision workbook. Maybe that's your next step. Maybe, maybe the next thing you need to do is just go straight through the workbook. If that's your next step, mark box number three on the back of your card. And number four says this. It says, I do not yet have a meaningful relationship with God, and I would like to know how to start one. Maybe you and God aren't on speaking terms yet. Um, or maybe you used to be, and you quit talking a while ago. If you don't have a meaningful relationship with God right now, then this is your next step. If you'd like to know how to start one, if you mark box number four on the back of your card, either I or an elder will call you and figure out a time to visit with you so that we can talk to, to you about how to have a real, living, growing, one-on-one relationship with Christ. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we come to you today with that song of commitment in our hearts saying, Lord, we do want you to shepherd us. We want you to lead us. And Lord, we make that commitment that wherever you will lead us, we will go. Wherever you want us to go, Lord, we will follow you. Lord, we ask for your vision in our lives. We ask for that clarity. We ask that you will help us to see things with your eyes. That we will see the people that we encounter every day as opportunities to witness. Lord, help us see the big picture. Help us see what your kingdom can be and what your church can be and how we can make a difference in South Central Kansas. Lord, change our hearts so that we follow you every day. These things we pray in your heavenly name. Amen. The Journey with God originates at the Cornerstone Seventh-day Adventist Church in Wichita, Kansas. Find us on the web at www.wichitacornerstone.org.